Well, my name is David Mulroy, and I teach uh, classics at, here at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. Among my teaching assignments, uh, for years I taught uh, elementary uh, Latin, and uh, I, I really uh, enjoyed doing that, and I thought it was a very valuable course. Uh, but uh, it was very difficult to retain students. Uh, most students uh, dropped out of the course, to, uh, you know, despite my finest efforts uh, after a semester or two. They just couldn't do the work. And it was obvious to me that the reason they couldn't is that they didn't understand basic grammar. They had no idea what a direct object was or a preposition, etc. So uh, along about 2002 or three. Uh, when Wisconsin was adopting new uh, educational standards, uh, I uh, w went to a public meeting uh, to, to make the case that high school graduates should uh, be able to identify the eight parts of speech, which seemed to me like an obvious su suggestion. And uh, I discovered that uh, the uh, uh, consensus among uh, educators uh, was that it was a waste of time to teach uh, young students grammar, that it just confused and frustrated them. I was really dumbstruck by that and uh, uh, decided to look into the issue, so I ended up uh, writing a book called The War Against Grammar uh, to uh, investigate how this opinion could have become established that, uh, that grammar was not important, when to me it seemed obviously uh, highly important. The part of my book that's mo most often uh, quoted is uh, a, an experiment I did with a large group of students, uh, giving them the first uh, sentence of the Declaration of Independence and asking them to paraphrase it. And uh, a substantial number of them, about half, uh, uh, didn't come even close to the, the meaning of the sentence, uh, <laughs> which uh, W w was kind of shocking, but it's it's because the sentence is uh, syntactically very complicated, and uh, it it just illustrates the fact that you need to understand grammar in order to uh, read with comprehension. A uh, typical response that to to paraphrase the sentence: uh, When dealing with events in life, one should drop preconceived knowings and assume that everything that happens, happens for a reason, and basically life goes on. That's a, an actual student's uh, summary of what the first uh, sentence of the Declaration of Independence meant. But to me it was a very clear example of the, uh, of, uh, the effect of not understanding basic grammar, that you're just uh, free associating, it's uh, interpretation by free association. Uh, getting meanings from isolated words and, and reconstructing them. And this is exactly how students of Greek and Latin operate before, before, when they're first learning the languages and before they understand the grammar, they know the meaning of vocabulary items and they guess uh, how they fit together in a sentence. In academia, people are, uh, the interpretation of text is big business. Uh, hermeneutics, the interpretation not only of literary texts but of paintings, of, of architecture, everything uh, can be I interpreted. Uh, but the in when people talk about interpreting things in this sense, they really mean interpreting without any canon of fixed rules. They're talking about interpretation essentially by free association and attributing uh, meanings to a uh, text which may not have been intended by the author and aren't, aren't prescribed by the words narrowly construed, uh, but are uh, somehow uh, suggested. Uh, often the meanings that are got at that way are, are political. On the other hand, uh, if you construe uh, meanings uh, strictly according to the rules of grammar and semantics, uh, then you have uh, the paraphrase of what's being said. Now, paraphrasing statements used to be a, uh, back in the, the, the Middle Ages and in antiquity, uh, a standard thing that uh, the students would do. They would get a poem and paraphrase the meaning, put its literal meaning in, into simple, straightforward prose. Uh, but 
that's fallen into disfavor. Uh, people have argued that to paraphrase a poem is uh, literally is to destroy its meaning, and by that they mean you're ignoring the uh, meanings you get through free association. So, um, what do you it, think well, it, <laughs> it's a great exaggeration. Uh, the uh, is it's gotten to the point where subjective interpretations are valued more than the actual interpretation uh, of a text according to the rules of, of grammar and, uh, uh, and, and semantics. Students are uh, typically asked more to react subjectively to texts than to explain what the text literally means. So it, it's, it's really as simple as that, that if uh, you, you emphasize the literal meaning of a text, you're uh, somehow re reducing it and uh, setting uh, uh, limits on it, but the, that a uh, student's uh, free subjective reactions are, are valued more. Once that's become dominant, that, that model of literature has become dominant, it uh, leads to the uh, neglect of grammar and, and to, to actual meanings. And I, I think you obviously lose a huge amount uh, when you lose respect for literal meanings. Yeah, I, I think that this has a devastating effect in any kind of debating uh, because people don't argue about what is literally being said, but they argue about the uh, associations of what's being said, uh, and the, the, the connotations of words instead of their, their actual uh, meaning. And sometimes not even actual, widely understood connotations, uh, but subjective it, it, yeah, it, exactly. So, exactly so. So, you, th this leads. It seems to me has has led to the whole regime of political correctness, uh, where certain, where any number of words and terms and so forth have become taboo, not because of their literal meanings, but because of their associations. If somebody finds their associations unpleasant, then you can no longer use the word, and, and you know. And they can even assert that there's this association, uh -huh. even if there really isn't one. <laughs> that, that's an excellent point. Uh, the, the, they are free associations. And so if a, if a person, if I say to you, your use of the word, I, I don't know what, <laughs> what desk insults me, I, you know, I, I guess it does. And you, <laughs> and you shouldn't use it. <laughs>
into more specialized, more advanced topics and neglecting the, the study of grammar. And there's even a poem by a 12th century educator talking about uh, students that don't, under, that don't understand the parts of speech, just like my students. This, this happened in the high Middle Ages. Uh, that uh, uh, education was uh, focused on uh, the study of law, for example, or the study of theology, uh, but conducted in a barbarous language, uh, like uh, somewhat similar to academic journals today, I guess, that the, the art of eloquence had been lost. Uh, and it was in the uh, following centuries, 1300s, 1400s, where you have the Renaissance, and this was a return to the study of grammar, uh, to, to properly, to, to Latin properly, properly written. The Renaissance uh, came, came to England uh, through the reformation of instruction and grammar and the famous English grammar schools were, uh, you know, carrying on the, uh, the Renaissance. And to make a long story short, uh, Shakespeare was one of the first beneficiaries of this Renaissance reform of uh, the instruction in grammar. So it, the, uh, the, the fortunes of grammar played the central role in the history of education in the West. That, that, that's what I learned. <laughs> Aren't people always complaining that the time before was better and that standards are um, falling? Uh, yes, yeah. That, 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 that's definitely an argument that you have to respond to. People have always thought that uh, college students uh, write uh, terribly. Uh, uh, but uh, Sometimes it's true. The era of the Renaissance uh, made it perfectly clear that there had been a real decline in verbal arts and a real rebirth. Uh, and uh, the, 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 the symptoms uh, going from the High Middle Ages through the Renaissance seem uncannily similar uh, to the conditions that we, we face today. So there's always a possibility of romanticizing the past, uh, but on the other hand, there are actual, uh, you know, declines. So can you talk a little bit about the decline you've seen? You, you started here uh, in 73? In 73, and yeah. In your book, you talk about adult literacy, SAT scores, uh, writing abilities, and uh, foreign language uh, yeah, study. Yeah. There's a, a marked decline in the number of students studying foreign languages. Uh, the uh, most st starting in starting in this in the late 60s. And from a language teacher's point of view, it's obvious that it's the difficulty with grammar that makes those subjects insuperably insuperably difficult for for students. Take the SATs. There is a uh, marked decline in both verbal and quantitative SATs in the, in the late 60s, and uh, eventually led to a recentering of the tests. And uh, at, at least as far as the verbal SATs go, it seems to me that it, it has to do with reading comprehension. That's that's my speculation, and and with the ne neglect of grammar. You, you say there's a false belief that modern linguistics had discredited traditional grammar. Can you talk about that? Uh, yes, uh, I, I think so. At the inauguration of modern linguistics, uh, you, you have the thought that uh, linguistics should be descriptive rather than prescriptive. And uh, traditional grammarians uh, with their rules have been sort of dismissed as being a prescriptivist, saying uh, that uh, uh, you you know you shouldn't end the sentence with a preposition and r rules like that that really don't make much uh, makes much sense. I guess uh, the the rule against splitting infinitives is the most notorious example, um, and uh, so that uh, traditional grammarians are dismissed as uh, 
uh, school marms that have uh, subjective rules, arbitrary rules that aren't really uh, justified and aren't reflected in how people actually speak. And uh, this is really uh, unfair in, in a number of ways. Uh, it, it's true that grammar teachers have in the past often suggested various prescriptive rules to follow to, in, to improve your style. But the real essence of what they teach are the, the rules that constitute the meaning of sentences, the, the parts of speech and their, the, their uses. And it's uh, really a great loss to dismiss that whole discipline to, together with a few misguided rules about uh, splitting infinitives or, or not. So there's the, uh, I refer in the book to the scandal of prescriptivism. Um, the, uh, the, the basic misunderstanding is the uh, false belief that uh, traditional uh, grammar teachers are essentially uh, prescriptivists. Uh, they're, they're not. They're, they're describing uh, the uh, rules that, uh, that uh, make uh, the structure of meaning possible. Uh, they're, they're not just transmitting uh, arbitrary aesthetic uh, rules. Um, there, there's, there's actually a, a little bit more to be said about that, even in defense of prescriptivism. Uh, I think it's an important point that the grammarians that established our accepted rules, uh, along with authors of dictionaries, are the people uh, who have established modern standard languages so that uh, the English language, <laughs> to take the obvious example, uh, is, uh, has become a world language so that uh, you and I are speaking in a way that's mutually intelligible with people in Australia and New Zealand and Canada and Britain. Uh, th th this standard English is really a marvelous creation uh, which you never would have had except for the work of uh, grammarians and, uh, and lexicographers. The fashionable attitude towards standard languages is critical. And there's, there's a saying among modern linguists that a standard language is just a dialect with an army and a navy. In other words, it's a uh, tool of, um, of political oppression and of uh, class warfare that uh, people, the, the right sort of people speak this dialect and others, others. Uh, but the fact is that having a standard language like English uh, is uh, hugely important in, in culture and education and economics. Uh, that uh, it, it, it facilitates, it facilitates uh, commerce and uh, especially uh, culture and, and, and literature. So uh, one, one of the, the authors who's uh, dismissive about uh, standard languages is uh, Steven Pinker, a great linguist, a great writer. Uh, but he, 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 he quotes the line about uh, a dialect with an army and a navy. And I don't know if it's occurred to him, but without standard English, he couldn't sell millions of books in Australia and New Zealand and Canada and, and the, the UK and America. Is it true, though, that the dialect that becomes the standard is the one that has, has a navy in it? I don't think historically that's entirely true because it seems to me that Latin remained the standard language even when uh, the uh, Germanic uh, barbarians uh, took over the Roman Empire. Uh, Latin was still the standard language of, of learning. And then uh, Greek remained a standard language earlier on, w af even after the Romans conquered the, East, the, the Mediterranean. Uh, so I, I think there are a number of counterexamples that the standard language doesn't really absolutely correspond to political power. Uh, so, so maybe it's that it, it makes sense uh, for the movers of any culture to use the language that gives them the most power, not political power, but the most power just in terms of economic yeah. development, cultural development. So sure, it's, yeah. It's the, the, 
Yeah, I, I, I see that there. That, yeah, that's yeah, the yeah. The, right. The, the, there are so many advantages to having a standard language that it, it's not just driven by who, by who's in power. Would would <laughs> linguists subject to there being a standard language? Uh, I, I, no, I, I don't think they go that far. I, I don't think they would prefer that to say that the English-speaking world would break up into dialects that were mutually unintelligible. I, no. Uh, although uh, they do value dialects, uh, and they are anxious that we don't, uh, we don't speak derisively of, of, of dialects, and they're, they're anxious to make the point that dialects are just as capable of communication as standard languages are. They tend to, ex it seems to me, exaggerate that somewhat. I mean, a standard language has uh, dictionaries and encyclopedias and educational systems and uh, famous authors, uh, whereas a, a spoken dialect uh, maybe potentially can express all the same meanings as a standard language, but in reality, when you learn the standard language, you get many more resources than you have from just knowing a spoken dialect. So the idea that they're equatable is, is a, a little misleading, I think. The attack on grammar uh, really began in the early 20th century with the progressive education movement and a kind of a uh, questioning and dismissal of all authority. I guess that the reaction against authority is uh, uh, central. Uh, in, in progressive education, you, you, you have uh, the uh, notion of the uh, autonomy of the child and the, uh, the student uh, who uh, just, you know, acquires knowledge freely uh, spontaneously, so that that's an important aspect of it, and certainly the anti-authoritarianism of the '60s uh, accelerated that uh, that that kind of uh, development. Grammar consisted of the rules by which meaning is established, and uh, students that understand grammar have this special insight into discourse in, in, in whatever form it takes. Studying the grammar of your own native language uh, enables you to use grammar with greater finesse, uh, with uh, uh, constructing uh, more uh, complex uh, sentences, I think, than what, what you pick up by osmosis through, through uh, immersion. The Declaration of Independence is an example. I mean, I, th that's why I think that is an instructive example. Uh, students who are immersed in English, who understand the meaning of words and so forth, uh, has, are certainly, is, to give every appearance of being fluent in English, uh, but there are uh, literary uh, sentences, compositions, uh, which are beyond them. Uh, because they haven't consciously mastered the, uh, the structures of grammar. So conscious mastery just expands your ability to, uh, to utilize those, those concepts. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with conscious knowledge. <laughs> it's, it's an advantage. And then, and then, of course, it's doubly true of learning a foreign language. If you have a conscious knowledge of how grammar works, then you, you instantly... Uh, uh, it's a huge advantage in learning a foreign language. Essentially, I think that these uh, minor issues like that are uh, usually come up uh, as a way to uh, minimize the importance of grammar to illustrate the triviality of grammar. and. Uh, uh, you, you really you can't, I, I, I don't think that they're that important, basically. I think that the essential uh, benefit of grammar is understanding the structure of sentences, the sentence, the, the subject and the object, predicate nominatives, uh, subordinate clauses, uh, linking sentences, transitive and intransitive verbs and so forth, those constitutive concepts. Uh, that uh, that uh, 
make, make language intelligible. I think it's a remarkable pedagogical uh, device. Uh, it's a way of representing the syntactical relationships with just, just, just a few uh, pencil strokes. And they il illustrate vividly the different uh, types of uh, sentences. There's a fifth grade uh, class that studied uh, sentence diagrams. And uh, the, uh, the exercise that they, they were given was uh, to uh, make up sentences that fit certain abstract diagrams. And they were entitled uh, to you to make up what they called gross sentences uh, to fill out these diagrams. So uh, I suggested a sentence diagram in which a gerund with a direct object was a subject of a linking sentence. A gerund with a direct object, subject of a linking sentence. And uh, I put up the, the diagram on the board without any words. And uh, immediately, this is a, a class of very well schooled in elementary grammar, I, I think fifth grade, so you know, a number of hands shot up, and, and a little boy suggested the sentence, spewing chunks. Spewing chunks is, how did that go? Unpleasant. Uh, unpleasant. Spewing chunks is unpleasant. So it was a gerund with a direct object. And uh, it, you know it, it, it fit perfectly. If you can't figure out the meaning of a sentence in Latin in the classical language, uh, it's almost always because you don't understand the syntactical relationships. And when you start to diagram the sentence and uh, make the syntactical relationships explicit, uh, the meaning usually emerges uh, quite clearly. And uh, that's al also the case with complicated sentences in uh, in one's own language. In the case of uh, the first sentence of the Declaration of Independence, uh, a, uh, a person who could diagram that sentence would have no doubt about its, about its meaning. In my own experience, I, I realized that uh, I, you know, I was a product of parochial schools, and uh, one thing I learned well in grade school was how to diagram sentences. And uh, I had often said that that was the most valuable thing I learned in all of my education uh, up through the PhD level. Uh, be, because uh, the the rules of grammar are are so are so fundamental to how language works, uh, everything in education consists of analyzing the meaning of of, of documents, and the basic uh, procedures that you, you you follow are uh, determined by, by grammar.